so we'll uh, cover um, some topics in, uh, in the epilepsy networks. And uh, when we uh, talk about epilepsy surgery, essentially the strategies which we have are four strategies. One is resection, the good old resection that we all know, such as temporal lobectomy. We now have ablation, which is a, a more uh, refined method, perhaps, and more targeted uh, for essentially achieving a lesion as well. And then uh, we have disconnection uh, strategies, such as the corpus callosotomy, uh, anterior to two third or com complete. And finally, we really have uh, very exciting technologies, uh, uh, which are already in use, uh, of uh, stimulation. So I, I will focus really on the, on the novel te technology rather than give you the uh, good old um, uh, ex experience that uh, has, has been uh, now going on for, for several decades. So um, when we talk about the, the, the changing landscape of epilepsy surgery, we're really talking about a shift uh, from a model where we look at epilepsy as some kind of a focus that we need to remove, and we're actually looking at it as a network that we need to modulate somehow in order to achieve our main goal, which is really seizure control. We're also trying to move from invasive to minimally invasive tech technology, uh, such as the laser technologies that we will discuss later in the afternoon in a symposium here. Uh, we move from resection to focal ab ablation and also from resection to modulation. Uh, the bottom line is that there are more uh, options now for patients, and that's the main issue. Now, when we're talking about epilepsy networks, you know, we know that we have the limbic networks, that we will talk about the mesial temporal lobe network of uh, hippocampal, and, and its an environ is the one which has been uh, subjected to a lot of epilepsy surgery. The insular network, the insular is sort of the new frontier in, in epilepsy surgery, uh, and in, in the, the past it has not been approached uh, in, a, in a surgical fashion for epilepsy. There is a temporal lobe network which are not mesial, they are neocortical. There is what I would call the temporal plus, meaning temporal and frontal some, sometimes, frontal temporal. The mesial frontal networks are, are, are very unique in the sense that you have uh, epilepsy emanating in the supplementary motor area. The difficulty here is a very quick spread to the other side and the difficulty sometime in lateralization of the phenomena really, of the beginning of the electrical storm. There is local lesional networks which are associated with tumors, with cavernomas, and uh, now uh, a lot with cortical dysplasia. And there are the neocortical networks and, and what uh, you know, is probably the ultimate uh, network, the hemispheric networks that we see mostly in pediatric and probably will be discussed tomorrow by Dr. Fala, uh, such as Rasmussen and cephalitis and other disorders which create a whole network which is very resistant to very focal resection. So either you need to remove the entire network or to disconnect it uh, from the periphery. So um, in terms of the dynamics of the network, we really have a pattern of spread of various uh, anatomical dest destination. Uh, there is a phenomena of secondary epileptogenesis. For instance, you have a hippocampal origin and, and, and then it uh, emanates sometimes to a mirror focus on the other side. There is a dual pathology. Occasionally a tumor close to the hippocampus will cause changes in the hippocampus, so removal of the tumor will not be sufficient. And the propagation patterns we know, you know, from classical ne neurology, for instance, the Jacksonian pattern, the spread over the motor strip, right, the ventral pathway, from occipital to temporal, so occasionally a, uh, an occipital lesion 
will uh, mas masquerade as a temporal lobe epilepsy. There's a dorsal pathway which will go uh, if, uh, along the parietal and frontoparietal routes. And of course, there is a bilateral temporal and bilateral mesial frontal. All this is quite difficult. And uh, actually, the, the Dr. Barry already mentioned this. I will not go over it. But an example of a network is, is that circuit of Pappas, uh, which we can see various stations involved. The, the singular gyrus may be involved, the hippocampus, of course, uh, and, the, uh, and other sites uh, along this uh, network. Uh, the seizure propagation here, I think Dr. Barry has covered that. So DBS uh, is a method of really directly targeting this anatomical network, okay, and uh, somehow modulating it. Of course, not completely, because the results are, are not seizure-free usually with the situation, but we can modulate the network. And there is a question sometimes with this chronic uh, mod modulation, whether there are no long-term effects uh, which are positive, really. Uh, so in a non-lesional epilepsy surgery, we really uh, are facing our most difficult situation. We have to generate a hypothesis based on, on the nature of the seizure, the interictal and ictal EEG, the PET, SPECT, uh, the neurocognitive profile, the, 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 the MEG, and then sometimes fMRI EEG. So it's, it's sort of a very, uh, very complex workup which leads to hypothesis, but unfortunately, in many cases, we have to do invasive monitoring, and that also has been a technology which at UCLA has been used for over 50 years but is now uh, essentially advertised as a novel technology. Uh, and basically, this is the depth electrodes uh, that you can see here, the, the UCLA electrode that is used you know, with the macro uh, contacts, uh, essentially, uh, which are here, the macro contacts. Uh, and we also have the micro contacts. Patients are monitored. Electrodes uh, location can be uh, very precisely targeted and confirmed here, for instance, in the hippocampus on the right and toronial cortex. And today we are able to take the post-operative CT, fuse it to the MRI, and do all kinds of uh, quantitative manipulation to really get the exact uh, targeting of our electrodes. Here in this hippocampal and toronial uh, circuit, we can see whether we are in entorhinal in the hippocampus, we have a fantastic uh, resolution capabilities here. So at UCLA, our numbers, we are now at the 504 patients. Uh, since 1993, we have used a different type of electrode, uh, and we blended 215 patients, uh, over 2,000 uh, macro contacts, and over 20,000 uh, micro. Technology has been quite safe. The, the bleed rate uh, in, in, in our hands, we, we had uh, uh, two, two bleeds. Uh, only one had temp temporary neuro neurological sequelae. And uh, so these are also the numbers uh, worldwide. They usually vary between one and, and, and three percent in the, in the various series. Uh, so it's a, it's a fairly safe uh, technology. Uh, so, but but the, the, the issue is that sometimes what you see on the MRI is what, what you get in terms of the epilepsy. Here is a case of a patient that I'll present uh, in more detail maybe later in the afternoon in the, uh, in the laser ablation uh, symposium. This is a patient who presented uh, with very unique type of complex partial seizures. But there is this uh, tumor here, which turned out to be a DNET. But the issue is that the patient basically presented with temporal lobe epilepsy. So when you go after this, of course, sometimes if you cannot remove the, the entire lesion or you don't remove the interface of the lesion uh, with a network, then you may achieve a lesion removal or partial lesion removal, but you may not get the ultimate uh, goal, which is really a seizure-free outcome. So here is a, you know, the last technology I will discuss, and, and I'll do it in some detail, because I think it is a landmark technology. It's only in the beginning. So the idea here is, as opposed to deep brain stimulation, which is a one-way street, right? You stimulate from now to, it, to eternity. Uh, this one is a responsive neurostimulation. It really acts based on sensing of uh, electrical activity. 
uh, and here epileptogenic electrical activity is sensed and then response, uh, responsive stimulation is applied. So these are also cranially implanted. We implant the uh, neurostimulator essentially in the skull by doing a small craniectomy here. And uh, at the current technology, we can connect it to two leads. Each one has four contacts. So we can only cover four either by depth electrode by SEEG, what's called stereotactic EEG, and or stere stereo EEG, and or by subdural contacts. So uh, this is uh, the general hardware that can be used. So indication 18 years or older, although it is now used also at UCLA for younger patients, a uh, patient have failed two medication, have partial onset cheeser that are localized to one or two foci. Other consideration, patients at risk of neurological or cognitive deficit with resection say, I don't want to take this risk, I will go for RNS. Patients who choose uh, not to have a re resection for various reasons, including the functional uh, reason, of course. So you have the RNS uh, program, it continuously senses electrical activity, record, and the physician programs it to detect specific abnormalities. Those are usually interictal, and sometimes this gizmo goes into action 1,000 times a night or more, okay? The patient, of course, doesn't feel, doesn't wake up. It's completely, uh, you know, completely innocuous in that sense. Uh, so at UCLA so far, uh, we have done uh, 45 patients. Uh, most of those are adults, but some of those, I think about seven were done by, by Dr. Fala on the pediatric uh, group. Uh, the first one we implanted in August 2014, uh, 22 were mesial temporal, uh, where unilateral were seven, and I'll explain why we didn't do a resection. Bilateral 15, obviously, bitemporal foci, two lateral temporal, and 21 extra temporal. So 20 patients we have done in the, in the last year. In fact, we are the leading site in terms of number of RNS which have been placed in the last year. So you can see by, by this increase that this is a technology which is just in the beginning. Uh, and you can see here the uh, method. So here you have an, an example of a patient who needed to have a subdural uh, strip placed uh, again with this uh, arrangement. Uh, uh, and you can see then uh, what we see on the, on the uh, MRI or, or the, actually we cannot do an MRI, we can only do a CT and we can fuse it to the MRI uh, and then find out exactly where. So these are four depth contacts in the hippocampus proper. You can see that right here. Okay, so, uh, and then you can see what happens with, with therapy on and therapy off. So when you essentially, uh, you get a situation when it's off and you get a seizure in the same situation, when the therapy is on, it's a, a bunch of uh, five pulses, uh, it can avert a, a, a seizure on, on some occasions uh, or possibly prevent. So we can see here, uh, I uh, have used a lot of, of the orthogonal placement uh, of, uh, of, of probes. So you can see here in the entorhinal area, it's an orthogonal placement, uh, you can see uh, uh, here with the red, maybe it's a little difficult to see, uh, but right here, you know, this is right in the hippocampus. So you can cover the hippocampus itself, but you can also stimulate, you know, from here to here and cover a larger uh, area. Uh, occasionally, uh, we need to use a posterior approach. And you can see, you cannot see it very clearly here, but this uh, right there is, uh, is, is right here is uh, the trajectory that we use to cover uh, the longitudinal aspect of the hippocampus, okay? So, let's see. Okay, here, so, so this is one example. The second example is this gentleman who has had a very severe uh, motor uh, seizures. Uh, he was still able to teach. There is a lesion here, which is cortical dysplasia. The patient doesn't want to take any motor risk, so he is a functional uh, teacher, and, and uh, we end up actually doing a grid in the hope that we'll be able to, to, to get better delineation. But unfortunately, all the mapping here uh, showed us stimulation. So we mapped the functional network and the patient did uh, eventually go to subdural strips placed on this uh, motor area and it's got about a 70% improvement in the frequency of seizure but it's not seizure free. 
is a, a case, another functional issue, a RNS in a language area. This is a patient who uh, had seizure uh, coming from that left uh, temporal, uh, posterior temporal area, ictal EEG, uh, and in fact, the MEG, the magnetoencephalography, which is a very useful tool, has showed it right here. So this is really the traditional, you know, Wernicke area. So we really could not uh, do anything here. Actually, we even mapped it, you know, and, and found out all this error, the paraphasic uh, error that happened uh, it was up right here uh, doing it with subdural grid. So we ended up really putting uh, a, a, these strips. And I, I was very skeptical about this actually working, but I saw the patient recently after a couple of years, and she said, you know, I do have very, very uh, minute uh, sort of seizures where I am spacing out for a second. Nobody notices it's a very infrequent. So she's not seizure-free, but the quality of her life uh, in this particular case has, has, has really changed and has been modified. I, I wasn't very optimistic in the beginning. Now, the other uh, possibility is to use RNS uh, together with a resection. So you resect this area, but then mapping shows some function here, so we can combine a resection with uh, our RNS, okay? So, in terms of the result that we've had so far, this is actually done mainly, uh, our chief neurologist who is doing it is Dr. Don El Eliashiv, together with Dr. Stern. Uh, and Dr. El Eliashiv summarized you know, our experience and we had follow-up on 34 patients with a median uh, uh, percent reduction of 75%, okay? The responder rate, the responder defined as greater than 50%, is 85%, not seizure-free, and what we uh, call super responders, these are patients uh, who, are, uh, who are essentially having greater than 90%. So six patients who are seizure-free, I mean, it's a small number, but it's not insignificant, and then 11 are really super res responders. So, you know, I think we will learn probably the indication for this technology a little bit better. I'll conclude just with this uh, single uh, case to to demonstrate the complexity here. This is a patient who is 29 year old, seizure onset at the age of two. He's got right facial pulling, left versive head turn, dystonic posturing. Uh, this is a semiology, okay? Basically, the interictal initially was uh, thought to be T3, and then he had also interictal on the other side. He had ictal, which was broad onset in the left hemisphere, really. MRI was non lesional, nothing. FDG PET showed some left temporal hypermetabolism. MEG was pretty scattered. Uh, so we uh, did not feel comfortable about uh, doing a resection in this case. And uh, we went to uh, essentially uh, intracranial monitoring with SEG. And based on this, we actually got a combined onset in the temporal lobe in the mesial temple at the same time at this orbital frontal area. So, you know, we really uh, uh, felt that we are dealing with a very wide uh, network. So I placed RNS, uh, two depth selectors, one here in the hippocampus and one here in the orbital frontal region, okay? And uh, so, work up with this. Uh, and actually, you know, I should say that initially we actually uh, I, I wasn't accurate. We initially did per perform an, an anterior temporal lobe resection because we felt that the onset was not mesial but lateral, and this had a poor outcome. We proceeded with this uh, RNS based on the depth electrode study with uh, LMH and LOF, left mid hippocampus and orbital frontal, with a contact which are widely spaced. So we sampled both mesial and lateral, and we felt with this wide sampling, we will uh, do well, but we haven't done very well, in fact, and the patient continued to have seizures. So in retrospect, what we felt that we might have uh, missed an, an insular onset, which can masquerade sometimes in giving both frontal and temporal uh, el electrophysiology. So we placed an additional insular electrode uh, that you can see here, in fact, you can see the, the tip of the electrode in the RNS right here in the insula. 
And it actually did, it, it did achieve a uh, you know, better result in this case. In fact, the detection percentage since, uh, since, the, uh, since this was done uh, went up because we, we had a much higher de detection uh, in the insula compared to the LMH. So we did uh, see that actually most of the activity was in the insula. So this is just an example, first to show that, that life is not easy, but also to show that these networks can be very tricky. So the, the advantage of RNS, and I should say this just as a, as a final comment, is that what we have seen in some patient, uh, we have placed two RNS electrodes, one on the left and one in the right temporal lobe, because we thought this was a bitemporal epilepsy. And indeed, we had such a, such a patient, and uh, over a period of one year, we saw that 95% of the seizure actually came from one side, the left side. So we ended up actually going and doing a resection on the left side, and the patient has been seizure-free now for, I think, over, over six months. So the real issue is that uh, this RNS uh, technology, responsive neurostimulation, is also good for long-term monitoring. And sometimes this long-term monitoring in the patient's natural environment can lead uh, to a more uh, definitive uh, treatment. So in conclusion, epilepsy networks can be modulated by ablation and stimulation. RNS is a breakthrough technology that offers new options for patients with intractable localized epilepsy. Useful indication include bifocal epilepsy, modulation of functional epileptogenic network that cannot be resected, and RNS can be combined with resection and finally can serve as a long-term monitoring tool of the epileptogenic network. Thank you very much.